Hi everyone, it's Raghu, and I'm back with uh, Ramdas here and now, a new podcast, a blast from the past. This one's from 1976 in Bristol, Rhode Island, which I've never heard of. <laughs> he really did get around. Um, and I'll uh, introduce what this one is all about and how it struck me. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I think there's a last-minute chance uh, that you'll be able to sign up for this wonderful free retreat. It's the first virtual retreat live that we are doing this year, um, April 18th and 19th. Go to ramdas.org, just go up to the top banner and click on it and just put your name in and you'll be in it. And it's uh, Mirabai Star is going to be uh, doing some Dharma talks around Ram Dass's, uh, various uh, excerpts from talks he gave, especially addressing uh, the radical changes that we are in right now with this pandemic. And, um, and the first thing in the morning, Saraswati Anand, she's going to be giving essential practice information on breath work, pranayama which is something, uh, probably the biggest help that we can have, because whenever you have that kind of anxiety come up that we are all having, being able to use your breath to calm down and get spacious around this fear and anxiety is really important. Okay, so that's going to be there. And then Mirabai Star, as I said, and then I'm going to do something with a guy named Bruce Damer in the afternoon. He is a marvelous man, a scientist, psychedelic pioneer. He won't like me saying that, maybe. Uh, pioneer is not the right word, but certainly uh, he was uh, really close to everything that Leary represents, Tim Leary. I'm going to do science and spirituality thing with him that Ram Dass wanted me to do forever. And Govindas is going to do some kirtan. Now, these are people that were going to be in the retreat in Ojai that we had to cancel. And thereby, here we are. And then on Sunday, uh, more Mirabai and Saraswati, and I'm going to do something with uh, Rameshwar Das and Krishna Das uh, in the afternoon around love and the Ramayana and K.K. Shah, who some of you know who he is, and we're going to explain that all out on Sunday. And then... It ends with East Forest and that, that incredible music that he did with Ram Dass. He's going to do a live thing. So you can still sign up. All right, get on over to ramdas.org and put your email address in, to, or if you, uh, once you click on the old thing, the link. Um, okay, so this talk that Ram Dass gave uh, back then, uh, it's basically around dharma and what dharma and what it means and how it is uh, so important in our lives to connect with and you could say become as one with as once you do that so much other stuff falls away so much other attachments and so on uh it's a, a, another uh, again i say this i'm not going to say it anymore how much Every time I listen to something, I think I know it all, but I don't in terms of what Ram Dass has said in the past. Otherwise, I really don't know it all. Um, so, and his example here of Dharma, a sweeper can be a better sweeper than the king can be as a king, right? It's, it's the relationship that you have in that you are using every moment as a uh, as a way to merge with the divine, I would say. Ramdas says it's it's the only the game is to get to God, and you can only do that through understanding what your path is in this life, Dharma, and you can become completely identified with that law, the law that is the truth. Um what does he say? He says, uh, so beings that are born into an incarnation and perform different acts, different kinds of work, different skills and personalities and bodies, each being is perfect in what they're needed to bring them to union with the divine. Um, so 
He says in, at one point, there's no form that's any better than any other form, right? In the transmission of the Spirit. Not one thing or another is better. And I had a perfect uh, experience of that. I used to say, on you know, I have the Mind Rolling Podcast. Go to Mind Rolling Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. And uh, I said more than once, boy, am I lucky to be able to be doing the work that I do. It's so identified with my lifestyle, which has been around spirituality uh, since the time I followed Ram Dass back to India. And I... So I was always espousing this as a, wow. I mean, I wasn't saying I'm so great. I was really saying, well, just to, to, to be able to do this, how dharmic is this, right? And anyhow, um, one time about a week after I think I said this again on a podcast, I went to get some shoes at a shoe store. Oh, so, uh, God, here's the punchline. Every time... That or the the point of the whole thing is that I used to say I'm so happy being able to do my dharma. Uh, you know, it's better than selling shoes. That's what I said. It's better than selling shoes. And then I got out because I needed to buy some shoes. A week later, and I go into a shoe store, and a guy comes. The salesman comes to uh, serve me. I mean, trust me, I have never had anybody <laughs> take care of me that way how he knew everything about, like I described what kind of shoe I wanted. He knew everything about the shoe, about the arch, about everything. And he brought these shoes out and he had other other samples that he thought maybe a, this might be good for you too. He was completely devoted and one-pointed doing his thing. And I, then I got it. I got it. It doesn't matter what you do, it's how you do it and, and, and your relationship with it. And you find that place, no matter what it is. And it's Ram Dass. He goes on about uh, the sweeper a lot in this, uh, in this talk. A, a perfect sweeper is able to embody the spirit far more than a, a, a priest might or you know, some other example like that. So yeah, you got to quiet down to to be able to to get there. You absolutely have to quiet down. And you know, he says a billion times, and we all have been saying this. Practice. You've got to find a regular place, a regular moment. Early in the morning is good. That you can just be there with the presence, however it is you want. Just starting there. I don't care if it's just going and talking to uh, to Mother Mary. Just about the troubles you've you're having, and about the hopes, and about the the worrisome attachments, and so on, like that. Even just every day doing that, you know. And so he talks a lot about that in in, in this talk. And and then there's also the thing of you know, if only I was in a better circumstance, if I had more money, or if I was able to take off work so that I could spend more time as a spiritual practice. It's that big if only. And, um, you know, and of course, for each of us in every moment, it is perfect for us to go to God, as Ram Dass says. Right? And his, uh, you know, we, we have all these stories we tell us. He tells this great story, which he's told before, and, you know, I've heard it a billion times, but I love it every time. He goes to, you know, and you'll hear Ram Dass tell it, and then some of you are going to write to me and go, do I need to hear you tell the same story he told? But I love the story. I got to tell it a little, okay? I was there <laughs> even. So um, where he, he asked Maharaji, uh, Neem Karoli Baba, how can I awaken Kundalini? You know, he's going to India thinking he wants to be in a cave like Milarepa. This is his model, and this is, this is what he thought his dharma was. And Maharaji said, well, feed everybody. And, and then he says, well, I don't know. What about, how, how, what's the best way to find God? And Maharaji says, serve everybody. And he, it dawns on him later that it's not a matter of 
being in a projected, quote-unquote, spiritual atmosphere that allows one to get to God. It's just the relationship with your moment. Everything that we are doing, if we can absorb into that uh, and be, be one with it, then we are f- totally dharmic. We are totally fulfilling our thing. Um, each of us has a way, you know, each of us has a way. Um, by the way, he talks, this is from 1976, and Ram Dass talks about mindfulness and stuff. Now, you know, it's part of the Eightfold Path, but still, I always said he was one of the originators of this whole mindfulness movement, for sure. Um, what else? Is there anything else? I mean, it's 40 minutes of incredible information. Um Yeah, I mean, he just talks about what I just mentioned, you know, having space in your life so you can keep remembering that it's a passing show, you know, that you're not sticking to your thoughts in the story you tell yourself. I mean, you got to have that kind of space and you you have to quiet down. And uh, here's something poetic, he said, okay, we can all repeat this. I want to make, get a musician uh, to do a song or something. The heart song is the Dharma. (laughs) Our heart song is the Dharma. Is that great? I love that. Our heart song is the Dharma. So this is a a wonderful talk. Again, as I sound like Ed Sullivan. Um, And uh, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. There are so many other great podcasts uh, and more coming, more people are going to be uh, joining us this year. I know we're a little bit well into this year, but we've gotten sidetracked a little. Uh, and um, a Mind Rolling, what I do is up there. And, of course, Jack Kornfield and Krishna Das and Lama Surya. Check out Lama Surya Das. I love him. He just comes at it from a completely different angle of thinking. Okay? This is... Ramdas, here and now. See you next week. In the Romans, Paul says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, Whether the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever part you play, you play it. You do your dharma. In India, there is a, a, an understanding of dharma in the villages. It's lost in the cities where they have bought into our mentality, really. But where there's an understanding of the dharma, it's incredible. You will meet a sweeper sweeping the streets of the town. He sleeps. He probably makes two rupees a day. He sleeps under a bridge, probably. He gets one warm meal a day, but in his mind, he understands that to do his thing in life as an offering to God is what his game is about, not to do another's. And he doesn't, in the pure sense, really, not not phony, he doesn't covet the king's role. And the sweeper can be a better sweeper than the king can be a king. Because the game is, he understands, he remembers the first commandment, which most everybody around here forgot. He remembers that the game is to get to God. And he sees his incarnation. See, in India, they have what's called the caste system, which we look at as some horrendous injustice, because 
once it falls apart, once God is forgotten, it is an injustice. But within God, it isn't. It says the wise men of the beings that saw how it all were, they look around and they say beings are born into to earth to do different kinds of work, to clean up their act, to work out karma. There are different life things. Some of you were born as men, some as women, some as rich, some as poor, some as with very quick intellective processes, some with slow ones, some with uh, skills, some without them. Some with physical beauty, some without it, from a cultural point of view. To the extent, what these wise rishis saw was that each being was perfect in what they needed to do what was necessary to bring them to God in that lifetime. And that for you, if you were born beautiful, don't get lost in the beauty, but use it as the vehicle for going to God. If you were born poor, work with the poverty to go to God. Don't covet the rich. That is, the statement is made in the Bhagavad Gita, do your dharma, not another's. To try to do another's dharma is a dharmic. I do this trip. This trip is no better or worse than all of the jobs that you are involved in now. It's just different. It's no higher or lower. It's just different. If you are a bus driver, if you're a leather maker, if you're a taxi cab driver, if you're a mother, you have as much opportunity to become a statement of the Dharma, to transmit the Dharma, as if you sit up and give lectures about the Dharma. Because I could be doing all this impurely, and you could be doing what you're doing purely, and you're getting closer to God and bringing more people to God than I am. There is no form that is any better than any other form in the transmission of the spirit. For each individual, there is an optimum form, and that is in harmony with who you are in this lifetime. So what becomes the game for you? Quieting down to hear your dharma, to hear your way through. If it is a sweeper, you are such an exquisite sweeper that you are floating in God as you sweep down the street. If you are a king, you are a totally conscious, clear, and compassionate king. No better or worse than the sweeper, just different. When you get to the point when you stop judging as better or worse individual differences and merely understand them as a matrix through which the Dharma is manifest, you're on your way home. As long as you sit and say, if only I had this, if only I could be in retreat all the time, if only I didn't have children, if only I did have children, if only I were taller, if only I were shorter, if only I had bigger breasts, if only I had smaller, if only I had blonde hair, if only I didn't have a mole on my cheek, if only I weren't dying, if only I were older, if only I were younger. You are as you are within your life just as it exists at this moment, there is dharma. You need only quiet down and listen for the dharma to hear it. The next moment, it may all be different. But at this moment, where you are is just where you need to be to come to God. It is a total cop-out to say, I'm in Boston. If only I were in New York, I could go to God. That's nonsense. God is no more in New York than in Boston. But think of how many times you do that. If only I had more quiet. If only I didn't have so much, so many, so the radio blaring in the next room, I could go to God. 
Go to God through the radio blaring in the next room. That's God, too. It's all the mother. Too much for you? Huh? God coming on a little heavy? See? Too much? What fire do you want, you see? When you really want the hot fire, you say, come on, come on, come on. I mean, I live in the middle of Manhattan. Violence, dirt, ugliness, yuck. stuff, 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 stuff. And beauty, incredible beauty. Saints walking all around the street. It's, it's interesting because in our office, people come in off the street that have come in from out of town. And you can tell when where they're at just by the way they walk in the room. Because they either they've had a walk down a street in which they probably met a lot of human conditions that offended them at some level or other. And they either walk in... You can see them. They're in a state of, thank God, I'm in this, this little island of sanity. You know, Let me get into the temple and quiet down before I talk to you because I'm just too uptight from the vibrations of New York. Or they just dance in, having danced with the city. Got mugged, got mugged. <laughs> I, I it's just more. Allen Ginsberg wrote a beautiful poem about being mugged in New York. It's printed in the New York Times. You stop pushing and pulling so hard, and you start to flow with your condition. You're fat and you're obsessed with food. There it is. That's it. That's your work right there. You think if you got thin, you'd be God would like you better? Like, I kept wanting to have a sadhana, a way that was very esoteric, okay? My intellect said, I'm going to go to the Himalayas, and there is going to be a teacher in a long robe that's going to appear on another plane. See, he's going to appear with light pouring on him, and he's going to say, you have been chosen, my son. Follow me. And he's going to turn and move his arm, and the mountain's going to open. And I'm going to be drawn, to, it's like reading too much uh, Lapsang Rampa or whatever his name is. You know? And I'm going to, the thing is going to open and I'm going to pour down into there and there's going to be a city of the initiates, right? And they're going to anoint me and put me with robes and take me into the inner chamber. And there I will be told the secrets of the universe. Right? And I end up in front of this old man in a blanket on a table who's throwing apples at me, right? <laughs> And when I say to Maharaji, Maharaji, I've been here for quite a while. Um, how do I awaken Kundalini? Figuring I'll get a secret teaching. And he says, feed everyone. Feed everyone? No. So I tried another day, another way. Maharaji, how can I best know God? Serve everyone serve everyone i mean that's what people were telling me for years i rebelled for years against the fact that this that i'm doing now is my yoga i didn't want this to be my yoga this is a drag this isn't exquisite i want to be like milarepa i want to sit in the cave and have green moss cover my body because i've been so busy going to god and here i am just Going around from college, you know, it's like bizarre. It's totally bizarre. What kind of a yoga is this? I didn't buy it. I protested against it. I fought against it. But here I am and I do it and it works because it's my way. And every time I get really cute and try to do someone else's way, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I told you the story. I wanted to go and study how to meditate and just meditate all summer. And I ended up teaching all summer. Maharaji just laughed at me. Ah, oh, Ramdas, the teacher. Teacher never showed up. Ramdas ended up the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dharma. It's my dharma. I've given up teaching so many times now. I mean, I'm, the one I'm doing this time is so weak. When I say I'm leaving in August, I know I'm beaten, completely beaten. I'm just sort of making one last feeble effort 
to sort of take a moment off, you know? You know, I took LSD and I thought, now I'm going into the higher teachings. I'm finished with Harvard and teaching never again. A year later, there I was lecturing about LSD, right? Then I went off to yoga and I said, now I'm done. I'm going to go to India and become a mountain sadhu. Back a year later, lecturing on yoga, right? Again and again. No way out. That's it. That's my route. Each of you has a route. You may fight against it. Struggle against it. You have a child, see, and you read the sadhana routine that says meditate 40 minutes at night. And you go in to sit down and meditate. And just as you sit down, your child walks in and cuddles up in your lap. But the child's going to screw up your meditation. Don't you see mummies meditating? <laughs> You've created a whole scene right there. Right? Don't you understand that your child is your dharma? Your child is your dharma. The meditation is fine. Your intellect says it would be nice to meditate, but your child says, not now, mummy. It's the way it is. If your body is dying, that's your exquisite opportunity to come to God. There is no place where any of you are sitting at this moment that isn't the optimum place to come to God for you right now. It is absolutely bullshit, if you want my honest opinion, to keep creating statements of I can't do it now because. Because I'm not standing in the right place and looking from the right angle. So you look at the world in a way that's productive to getting out of it. You look at the world as the Dharma or the law or the, and that's what studying of the Torah and the Talmud is about, is seeing it all as God's law and finding your way into it. You see the world as the Dharma, you see it as the teachings of the guru, you see it as the mother. You see it as show, you see it as game. All of it will work. You see it as illusion, that's show, same as show. Having seen it this way, what do you do about it? What do you do in your daily life? I've got to give a variety of ways because each of you has to find your own. You can't imitate. You can just hear. One thing is to have a little space in your life so that you can keep remembering. You can keep remembering that it is passing show, that it is the Dharma, that it is the mother. That's what meditative space is about. And if your scene is heavy, you get up earlier in the morning. You get up when everybody else is asleep and then nobody will bother you. And you sit quietly. And we're going to talk about those kinds of sadhana tomorrow. But what I'm saying is you may want to incorporate into your daily life some slightly regular sadhana, a regular practice of some sort. Okay, that's all for tomorrow. You quiet your mind so you can hear the way the law is. If you are too attached to your desires, you can't hear the way things are. So you have to quiet down to hear the way they are. So as we sing, when we sing that song, listen, listen, listen to my heart's song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart's song. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. And the heart's song is the Dharma, is the way of things. Because in your heart, in the Atman is the entire universe. It's all in there. It's all in there. You do what you do every day. And you do it. It 
if you are following a devotional path, you would do it as an offering to Krishna, an offering to God, an offering to Guru. Krishna says, do what you do, but offer the fruits of your work to me. I want to read to you two things, one from Mahatma Gandhi and one from Don Juan, to talk about the way in which you approach tasks in life. Krishna says, do your work, but do it without attachment. Krishna says, first of all, great is the man who free from attachments and with a mind ruling its powers in harmony, works on the path of karma yoga. The yoga of living, working out one's karma. In liberty from the bonds of attachments, do thou therefore the work to be done. Set thy heart upon thy work, but never on its reward, says Krishna in the Gita. Work not for a, re a reward, but never cease to do thy work, says Krishna. Now, Mahatma Gandhi spells it out because he was a great student of the Bhagavad Gita. He says, in regard to every action, one must know the result that is expected to follow, the means thereto, and the capacity for it. He who being thus equipped is without desire for the results and yet is wholly engrossed in the due fulfillment of the task. Such a man is said to have renounced the fruits of action. Let me read it once more so you can get a feeling. for it. In regard to every action, let's say you're going to drive from here to New York City. You must know the result that is expected to follow. You expect to get to New York City. The means there too, I'm going to go by car. And the capacity for it, I know how to drive, the car has gas, it works, it should get to New York. He who being thus equipped is without desire for the result, that is, I may never get to New York. Got it? And yet is wholly engrossed in the due fulfillment of the task, yet I am driving consciously and aiming towards New York. Such a man is said to have renounced the fruits of his actions. That is, I am attempting to share the Dharma with you, whether you understand the Dharma is your karma, not mine. If I'm attached to whether you understand it, then it's my karma. Do you understand that one? Right. When I came back from India in 1968, I was in a very, very high state at that time. I don't know what happened, but I, at that time I was in a very high state. And Maharaji had sent his ashirbad, his blessing, that I should write a book. So I came back and I wrote a book. I sat down, I typed a book, and I did it with total involvement because Maharaji said to do it, and I expected I'd write a book and it would be published and all that. And then nobody wanted to publish it. Eight authors, eight publishers turned it down. And they wrote nice letters saying, our line in this area is filled. And I said, well, therefore, this book apparently isn't to be published at this time. And I wasn't terribly upset by it. I had anticipated a certain goal, but I wasn't attached to whether it happened or not. You can't imagine the joy of participating in a task when you are not attached to how it comes out. That's the whole secret of healing. You heal. You are totally realizing that there is a possibility that something can be healed. You understand that if you are pure enough and meditate and open yourself to God, the force of God may come through you and may heal that person. You do it with total engrossed involvement in the task. You're totally engrossed in the process of healing and you're not the least attached to whether it happens or not. That's the secret of it. It's the secret of all of living life, of every act you do. The minute you are attached to the fruits of the action, there is suffering. 
and there is judging God. Don Juan talks about the warrior because the warrior is the perfect karma yogi. The warrior is the hunter. He calculates everything. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. That's control. But once his calculations are over, he acts. He lets go. And he survives in the best of all possible fashions. The mood of the warrior calls for control over himself. And at the same time, it calls for abandoning himself. That is, you have the awareness to see what is expected, how it works, how it does it. Then you totally involve yourself in the thing. And at the same moment, you don't cling to how it comes out. Far out design what karma yoga is really about. That's why you study the Bhagavad Gita, because it just keeps describing this process over and over again. And if you can hear, that is the way of doing acts joyfully and lightly and letting every act awaken you and feed you. We aren't who we think we are. We aren't even the thinker. We certainly aren't the actor on the stage. There is coffee being made and toast being made. Who's making it? I'm making it? No. I am. And there is toast and coffee being made. To become who you are is to sit in peace and quiet all the time. There is talking now, but I am not talking. If you identify me with this body and this mouth, then you cannot understand that statement. Let me say it again. There is talking at this moment, but I am not speaking. Now try it on you. There is listening, but you are not listening. You and I are here. And that of us, which is me, speaks. And that of us, which is you, listens. But you and I neither speak nor listen. We are. When you meet another being who understands that, your eyes meet and you meet in perfect peace. You may meet as competitors. You may meet in battle as Arjuna met his cousins, in which the act is to kill one another. But no one is lost in being the actor. All of the spiritual practices are designed to extricate you from being lost into identification as the actor, as the body which decays and dies, as the desires which are satisfied and then frustrated and a moment later want more, as the sensing apparatus constantly grabbing at experiences, as the person seeking God, the person on a path just another actor, you aren't that either. Each of you comes up to me again and again and tells me who you are busy thinking you are. Completely identified with the actor. And I look at you often and I wonder, how do I be with you behind that? And I say, well, I hear all that, and here we are. But if you are totally lost in the acting, you can't hear what I'm saying to you.
the secret of living life is not to live life, but to be life. following of the breath, the doing of the mantra, the loosening the hold of your identification with you as the rider on the subway, as the person going to the toilet, as the person hanging out and talking. How beautiful the silence has been this week when you could, in the silent space of quietness, watch life going on. How beautiful when the space is within you and you reside in it and you can watch your own life going on. Watch yourself traveling. Hello, how are you? Where are you from? Oh yes, that's interesting. I've been there. Do you know so-and-so? Yes, isn't that interesting? Oh, I'm going here. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Is that incredible? Oh, I feel much better. That's good. <laughs> and here we are. You here? I'm here. Dance after dance. How do you do it? You listen to hear it. How do you do it? You hang out through books, through tapes, through people with those who understand that they aren't who they think they are. And slowly, 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 you get caught a thousand times and a thousand and one times you awaken. until you sit quietly where there is no death and there is no birth and there is no action. And all around you, everything is getting done perfectly. You make a gamble, you invest in a business and it goes bad. If you are the investor, that is a loss. If you are the being going to God, it is more grist for the mill. Very simple. Are you the investor or are you the being going to God? If you're in the investor, it's going to be suffering. If you're the being going to God, it's all grace. Very simple. What do you want? Once you have deepened your understanding and know that you are on this path, even that is an illusion, of course, because you are the path. All the stuff in you that doesn't get you there, that isn't dharmic, that isn't in the flow, you let go. You don't have any use for it anymore. How do you let go of it? How do you let go of your anger, ill will, sloth, torpor, lust? How do you let go of it all? What do you do about all that stuff? Well, first of all, you have clearly in mind discriminative wisdom, that is, what it is that leads to awakening and freedom and what doesn't. And perhaps the cleanest and best description of that 
is what's called the Buddhist Eightfold Path, the fourth noble truth enunciated by the Buddha. Because Buddha said very simply, Everything in time is suffering. The cause of suffering is clinging to that which is in time. End clinging and suffering. How do you end clinging? You do it by the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. You can get the Eightfold Path for yourself, glue it on your mirror, and just start to live by it. He just said there are just, he just was so simple minded, it was absurd. Everybody thinks Buddha is so complicated, but he said it very simply. It's just eight things you got to do. First of all, you got to understand how it all is. It's called right understanding. Understand about, the, about suffering and about karma. That's what you study for. The things are impermanent. Understand all that. Then he says, fill your mind with right thoughts. All right. Support them. Thoughts that are free of ill will and cruelty. You cultivate them. You cultivate thoughts of love and harmlessness, simplicity and compassion. So once you see the catalog of thoughts, you got a thought and you run down. No, it's not on that catalog. You let it go. Very simple. I mean, he's giving you a very nice mechanical way. Right speech, that's a nice one. One of the Eightfold Path, right speech. Imagine that. Free of gossip. You ought to hear this one. This you could hear. If you really want to clean up your act, this is it. Free of gossip. Free of lying. Free of abuse. Free of harsh language. Free of speech that causes disunity or breaks up harmony. Ready to clean up your act? There it is. There it is. You keep saying to me, well, what should I do? Buddha told you what to do. He gave you eight things. You do them, you'll get enlightened. Right action. Free from killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. That is sexual acts that would cause pain to others, which would be exploiting somebody else sexually or adultery in which somebody else gets hurt. It's a reverence for life. Right livelihood. There's one. Earning your livelihood in a way which does not harm others. Ultimately, if you're on welfare without good reason, either illness or dependence, you are taking money that I'm paying in my taxes, and I'm earning money to support you, and that's creating paranoia in me. And that's creating disunity. And ultimately, that isn't right livelihood. It may be for time because of the job market and so on. I understand that, and it's all very flexible. But as a permanent strategy, exploiting a system is not conscious. You ultimately must be involved in the providing of goods and services for fellow human beings in some way of earning your livelihood that is dharmic. You can't exploit people on one hand and then turn around and worship God on the other and expect to get it all together. Can't do it. It's a toughie, very tough. Right effort, meaning pushing towards it. That's the thing I said about free will and determinism. You act like you have choice and you make it. But it's like tuning an instrument. You don't push too hard and you don't push too easy. Some of you are trying to push too hard and you're gonna have nervous breakdowns. 
Some of you don't push hard enough. You're just lazy slobs. Right mindfulness. That's what we've been learning. How to be mindful, how to stay aware, how to stay conscious. And right concentration, learning how to be one-pointed in your mind, following the breath. Right understanding, right thought, right action, right speech, right livelihood. Right concentration, right mindfulness, right effort. Eightfold path, how to do it. How to do it. If your path is devotional, how do you give up anger, lust, ill will, and so on? You offer it. You offer it. Give it to me. I'll take it. But you've got to give it. I won't take it from you unless you give it. Maharaji, how do I give up anger? Give up a little each day. I will help you. How do you give up anger? Give up a little each day. I will help you. You offer it. You offer it to your guru. You offer it to Krishna. You offer it to Christ. You offer it to Maharaji. You offer it to the mother. The minute, and you catch the thing just in its seed form, not when it's taken full fruit. You get to the point that as you start to get angry, you let it go. You don't wait till you're full of anger. Give it up right at the beginning. Don't get up tight if you miss one and you blow it. When you notice it, let it go and go on. Give up guilt. Give up shame. Let it go. 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 You don't need it. There is an image of the mother, an aspect of the mother called Kali. Kali is horrible. She's gorged with blood and thus appears dark. She wears a circlet, a necklace of skulls around her neck. She has long canine teeth. She drips blood out from her tongue. She carries a dagger in her hand. She is horrible to behold. She is the aspect of the mother that exists to destroy impurities. She exists in order to destroy that in you which keeps you from God. The only reason she looks ugly to you is because you're holding on to something that's keeping you from God. When all you want is God, you say, here, Kali Ma, take it all. She eats your impurities. Here, Ma, you eat it. Here, Ma, you eat it. You got anger? Here, Ma, you eat it. You keep offering it to Kali. And she keeps taking it. And she eats it and laughs and dances and eats some more. You feed Kali, you feed the mother. You keep offering your impurities. And when there are no more impurities, when you have been purified, you look at Kali and you do not see the horror. You see the golden beauty of who she really is. For that darkness or that horror, is only because you are clinging. Storms, typhoons, death, decay, violence, these are all Kali. All of this is only horrible to you because you're clinging. If you are not afraid of death, if you are not identified with your body, if you are not clinging to this and that, none of this is horrible. Nature is not horrible. Is fall more horrible than spring? Really? Really? 
Is winter horrible? If the earth opens and there are earthquakes and people are swallowed up and incarnations end, is that horrible? Yes and no. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.